Okay, we're going to get started here, and uh, this will be recorded, so you can refer to it. It'll be on uh, YouTube. Um, we're going to review what we talked about earlier because we're we're trying to understand more about what really takes place in this process that we know of digestion, and even further than that, what role these microbes play in the overall human health. And we're learning that it's really profound. They actually call them the world of psychobiotics in the fact that a lot of the mental chemicals that we need for our daily functioning are produced by the bacteria that are in our large intestine that are there to perform this digestive process. But it's beyond that, it's even more profound they bring the chemicals and neurochemicals that we need for mental balance as well. Um, thus, the term comes psychobiotics, which is a new term that we're now hearing more and more. Uh, let me. So this is our digestive system, which we knew about for years. This is really easy. This is a physical side and we could see it. We, you know, when they do autopsies, they could look and, and understand the human body. But when we really take a closer look, we found that these are the different bacteria that are within us. And when we break it down in the stomach, there's very few organisms that, that reside in the stomach because of the acidic condition. So there's a very small number of microbes that exist in there between a thousand and 10,000 microbes, that's it. But after you get through the stomach, which is basically an acid bath and, and your food goes through there, it goes into this small intestine, which is about 26, 27 feet long. So it's quite long and, and, and it, it goes back and forth and has all these swales. And, and during that time, it goes from being, you know, almost like an extremely strong rapids coming out of the, out of the, the, the stomach. And it's a very acidic environment. And, and as it keeps going through, and as it keeps going through these winding areas, you know, the simple carbohydrates that have been broken down and refined by our manufacturing processes are all absorbed through that small intestine. And, and in that small intestine, there's between 100,000 and 100 million of these microbes. So there's quite a few microbes, but again, a wide range that you can have there. But then the most astounding thing that we've learned in science in the last 10, 12 years is that this large intestine, this, this, this chamber that is as tall as I am, six foot tall, contains between 10 billion and 10 trillion microbes. And the varieties can, can be a thousand is, is what they wanna see at a minimum of a healthy person as high as 2000. So the, the amount of variety, and it's been described lately in some of the papers I've been reading, as being the most complex ecosystem that we have ever observed as humans. So of all the ecosystems on the human planet, we are now learning that the ecosystem within us, which is basically the operating system for the human body, is more diverse than the ecosystems on the planet. And what we're finding is that the ecosystems on the planet are, are, are mainly the same thing. They have huge numbers of microbes that are dependent, they are dependent upon in order to, to thrive and in order to grow. So, so what you have is you have these plants that we grow in the ground and, and we learned that we can just give them chemicals like nitrogen, potassium and potash and, and these plants will grow beautiful tissue. But what we, are now learning is that we're missing the magic of what really a plant should be. And that is that these plants in the ground have a relationship with both fungi and bacteria that break down all the organic matter and they have synergistic relationships. And the more bacteria and the more fungi that we have in the ground, the more nutritionally dense and healthier our plants are in the ground because they are producing their own defense systems because they got the raw materials to do it. And the same thing with the human body, 
Because when we then consume the phytochemicals and the phytonutrients that these plants produce, and our bacteria break those down, we are now producing the building blocks that our human body needs in order to be able to do whatever it needs to do to go to homeostasis, to be healthy, to be, you know, the, the human body it, it has been designed to live long and die quickly, not to die slowly over time. And if we're dying slowly over time, then what we've done is we've disrupted one of the systems, the systems that balance our body and, and our mind and the, and the whole system. And, and I can tell you right now, the biggest thing that we've done my whole life to the age of 60, I'm 65 now, but for 60 years, I didn't think about the microbial environment within me and what effect I was having on that ecosystem within me and how crucial that was. Now my system is so sensitive that if I consume, let's say a treat of, of, of something that might be sweet, um, I can feel that in my body because anywhere between two hours and two days, that's going to be metabolized and that's going to end up as a different chemical in my body and my body's going to react to it differently. And now that I understand that, I have a different awareness of, of what, you know, what really is happening in this body. Um, so let's, so, so these are just, I mean, look at, these are the, the organisms that are living inside of us, 10 billion to 10 trillion of these things. And they're all different species. There's bacteria, there's fungi, there's, there's uh, these one-celled objects. And I mean, you look at them and they're very complex. Viruses are very interesting because what they do is they hijack another organism in our body and they take it over. And that's how viruses uh, basically survive and how they, they procreate. Here, here's a cell. I mean, you think about this, we have all of these tiny microbes inside of us and look at how complex each and every one of them is. They have their own DNA. They have their own purpose. They're born, they have a purpose, they have DNA for instruction, they're going to eat, they're going to, to procreate, and they're gonna put out whatever micronutrients they do through their metabolism process. And this is all taking place inside of us. You know, We just think about us being alive. There are so many more things that are alive inside of us. And if you look at that DNA inside, DNA is the instruction material so that we know what to do. Now we take a look at the DNA in the human body. We have 22,000 genes, which are instructions as to what our body should be doing to function efficiently, to be healthy, to be in balance. When you add up the DNA that is in the microbes that are in us and on us, the number is between two and four million genes of DNA. Now, when you think about that, you know, at first when scientists learned that we only had 22,000 genes, a lot of the comments I was reading was if people would say, how could this be? How, how could we only have 22,000 genes when we have all these different functions, all these different neurochemicals, all these different things happening, neurotransmitters in our body, and they were perplexed by it. But now that we understand the microbes and we were able to take that same DNA testing and do that on the microbes, now this whole new world has just opened up and it's so new. It's like in the last 10 or 12 years is when this has taken place. And, and we're finding out that these microbes are in this ecosystem within us and that we have a ton of control over it because if we don't feed them, they don't grow. Or if we feed them, something that they shouldn't be eating. We're not gonna have who we want inside of us. These are some of the, the probiotic names that we hear about, lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, and S. boulardii. Lactobacillus is what you see in yogurts and cheeses. And lactobacillus has had a very profound effect. They've done lots of studies on it. One of the studies that really sticks out in my mind is a study where they did, um, they took a whole group, 30 individuals that agreed to sign up for the study. They took a baseline of their attitude and how they were feeling about life. They had them take yogurt every single day in their diet, loaded with lactobacillus. At the end of the 30 day period, everybody's outlook and mood had been enhanced from where they were. They had jumped up one to 
the five category levels and, and where they felt. And it's interesting because I was just reading another report just within the last couple of weeks that came out where they have now learned that lactobacillus is, is amazing for the human body, for mental attitude, producing serotonin, helping with the neurochemicals in the brain. But they're finding that it doesn't really like to stay resident in the human body, that, that they did a lot of tests on mice and they were assuming that mice in the human environment would be about the same. But now what they're finding is that it's not quite that way that, that the lactobacillus, we need to constantly be bringing another supply into the body, into the body on a regular basis, whether it be with a fermented dairy product or whether it be with a, uh, a yogurt, a non-dairy yogurt product like um, oat milk yogurts or almond milk yogurts or, or coconut milk yogurts. But the lactobacillus does not stay resident. The bifido, a great bacteria that's in the kimchi fermented pickles fermented uh, and and fermenting all these different foods tend to have different subcategories of bacteria that 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 love that bacteria that food product even more um and then s Bilardi is is one that we talked about last week it's it's a really beautiful aid and a probiotic in that if we introduce it into our ecosystem and we have an overpopulation of, let's say, a candida, which is one of the most prevalent that we have in our society. Espelardi will be like the big guys on the block. They'll come in the neighborhood. They'll start to take up residence there. They won't be um, hostile. They're not going to produce a war. You see, in, in this environment inside of us, I, I mean, you could really describe it as almost being like the world where you have different areas where there are fights and warfare going on. There's famine going on in some areas because those bacteria aren't getting fed the foods that they need. You know, there's um, damaged areas because of our gut surface not being proper for them to be able to, to, to set up their colonies around. You know, and, and it's quite interesting because there's a lot of studies that show that what happens within is happening without, that, that our environment without is kind of a reflection of what we're doing on the inside of us who knows which is leading which, but the bottom line is they're both starting to have the same lack of diversity, you know, the same problem with, with you know, a clean environment. Um, let me just get to the next slide here. These are the foods that the human body cannot digest per se, that we cannot absorb these foods without the aid of bacteria in our gut. And these are the foods that when we bring them in, that's where the magic begins in our process, in that whole digestive process. So on the left, what you have, think of that being the food stock. This is the dog food, the cow food, the horse food, the cat food, all the different species of bacteria and yeast and fungi that we want to feed, those are their favorite foods. On the right side are foods that have living bacteria or they fermented and broken that food down already. And those are the foods that you're bringing in that are still alive with organisms or spores in them. So think of pre being before, that's the food you're gonna give these different critters. And the stuff on the right is actually bringing these different microorganisms back into your ecology inside of you so that they start to take up residency and start to perform for you to produce the chemicals that will produce the body being in perfect harmony and perfect balance. These are the killers. This is what hurts us when we start consuming uh, GMO foods. And GMO foods, and this is really important that we understand what's happening in our food system. A genetically modified food means that they have taken, let's say a corn plant, and this corn plant has its leaves out in, in the field and it's growing, it's sucking up the sunshine, it's doing everything it should. And all of a sudden, this chemical is sprayed on it and this chemical shuts down the nutrient uptake system called the shamate uptake system and the plant can no longer pull up nutrients and its defense system dies and it gets attacked by hostile fungi and it shrivels up and dies within two days. 
A genetically modified corn plant, however, what they do is they go into the genes, the instructions that the plant has, and they turn the switch off for the gene that when that chemical hits it, it no longer considers it a poison and it lives. It doesn't die. Now the corn sucks up that glyphosate, which is a poison, which is also Roundup, and all of the weeds around it die, and the farmer has a clear field, and now that horn is, is har corn is harvested, and, and it's used in our food system, and it's absorbed this glyphosate, and glyphosate is, is I think one of the numbers was, it's, it's like 10 to, to, to 100 times more glyphosate is being poured on this on the United States, on our soil and on our food than the antibiotics that we're taking. And 80% of the antibiotics that, that we're comparing it to are given to all the animals that we're consuming. So 80% of all the antibiotics that are being consumed are, are giving fed to the animals to keep them alive and then we're consuming them. And the glyphosate, which is much, much more is being put on the plant material that we're feeding both our animals and we're eating ourselves. And all of those, are toxic to the microbiology within us. The micro, uh, this, this whole beautiful environment that is one of the most complex on the planet. Stress, people say, well, how could stress do that? Well, we have this amazing connection between our brain and all of the microbes in our digestive system through this system called the vagus nerve. And there's between one and 2 million connections that are two-way connections. They now learned that 80% of the communication is going northward from the microbes to the brain, and 20% is going southward from the brain to the microbes. So what happens when somebody is under stress? That's a fight or flight scenario. What happens is the brain goes into this, this hormone of we better get ready to fight or flight, the vagus nerve is sending a signal to the microbes that we've got a condition here and we are now in a fight or flight mode. And all of a sudden the chemistry of the gut changes, the secretions in the gut change. And I can tell you firsthand, when I used to have a non-intentional gut microbiome inside of me, and let's say something came up and I'm late for a meeting and I look and I see that I'm late and I'm running late. And what would happen is a shot would go down to my guts, my guts would be, my bacteria would all be put on charge. They would start to emit chemicals that would then go back into my brain. And what that used to do is that would make more anxiety for me because I didn't necessarily have the serotonin, the serotonin, the dopamine and the GABA producers that were in high dominance because I wasn't feeding those bacteria. I was feeding the parasitic ones and the ones that were producing more the cortisone levels and the levels that were creating more stress. Now, when I have that same thing, all of a sudden my mind is reacting differently because my, my mind is still saying, oh, we're late, boom, gets the gut going. The gut starts to get the bacteria going. What are they do, doing? They're producing serotonin, GABA and dopamine, which all are neurotransmitters that are now going to my brain and saying, guess what? It's all gonna be okay. And all of a sudden, I don't have that feeling in my stomach, which was a churning feeling. And I don't have the anxiety level that I used to have because I have different neurochemicals that I am now actively feeding on a regular basis because those are the guys I want for my backup. Those are the guys that are gonna make me perform my best, be my best. I'm gonna respond instead of react in life. I'm gonna be able to keep a level head because my chemicals are gonna be balanced. Um, antibiotics, you know, I, I talked about it, our animals that are getting them, you know, the amount that we're giving the animals to stay alive, it's just, it's horrendous. And then that's in the, the meat. If you're eating, you know, lots of meat that is commercially raised over sanitation now with COVID, you know, we're washing everything and, and, you know, washing is, it's important with COVID, but what a lot of the, the, the people are saying is that if we, if we did all the right things to build up our immune system, it would do 10 times more than all the sanitation in the world would ever do for us. Because we're capable, we have that capability. But if our system is at 50% capacity before we even have you know, a bug in our body, uh, 
you know, we don't have a, we don't have a lot of room to 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 protect ourselves. Um, and this is this is what our food system looks like. That's glyphosate being sprayed out there. What that'll do is that'll kill every single weed in that soybean field, so that those soybeans will go grow really well. And the other thing that happens here is that these Soybeans, you know, they fertilize the soil with these chemicals that now make the bacteria no longer needed in that ecosystem because they are no longer needed to have the symbiotic relationship. The plant can get its nitrogen elsewhere. Um, it produces, it gets all its chemicals from the ground. The bacteria aren't needed. They're being sprayed with Roundup. They're being killed. The nutritional density of those soybeans, you know, not in my body, not if I'm going to go through that process. You know, we only chew this stuff for 10 seconds or less. It should be longer because there's a big process that takes place. Um, but, you know, it's profound what it does to our human health. And we, we need to start thinking about that. This is what, how we want our food to be grown. Not in a monocrop with chemicals in a natural environment. This is the way our food system is. You know, organic is in the bottom left. Everything else is is everything with science and, and we're getting further and further away from just simple natural ways that, that can really make our lives so much easier. This is a beautiful movie. I just love to show it because this is what the magic that takes place inside of us every time we eat the proper foods like the resistant starch. Oh, let's see if we can get it to start here. There we go. We know that many plant foods benefit our health. Scientists now believe one reason for this lies with the gut microbiome, the bacteria in your intestines. Your microbiome is nourished by meals like this, rich in one type of dietary fiber called resistant starch. Resistant starch can't be digested by your body, but instead becomes food for your gut bacteria. Most starch is easily digested. Starch is dissolved in the small intestine and then absorbed by your body, providing you with energy and nutrients. The remaining non-digestible portion is called resistant starch. The resistant starch continues its journey through your gut and arrives at the large intestine. We see that the resistant starch has become exposed to the healthy bacteria of the gut microbiome. This species of bacteria specialize in breaking down the resistant starch. This breakdown process provides the bacteria with the fuel they need to survive. As they use the starch for energy, they release small carbohydrate molecules. The neighboring bacteria feed on these carbohydrates. As the bacteria feed, they excrete even smaller molecules as waste. One of the final waste products is called butyrate, an energy source for your body. As the butyrate builds up, it is absorbed by the large intestine. The presence of butyrate encourages blood to flow into the vessels of the large intestine, keeping the tissue healthy. If your diet includes enough resistant starch, these cells will use butyrate as their main source of energy. Here, we can see the molecular surface of one of the intestinal cells. The surface is covered in special proteins that actively pump butyrate molecules into the cell. Once inside, 
that can be harvested for energy. In addition, butyrate has other benefits. Intestinal cells are sensitive to DNA damage caused by environmental factors. This cell's DNA has been damaged, resulting in a mutation. More damage could accumulate over time as the cell divides, which could lead to colorectal cancer. But a steady supply of butyrate allows the DNA damage to be more easily detected and the cell can activate a suicide program in response. Because the damaged cell destroys itself, it can't progress to form a cancer. A starved microbiome is unable to protect you from cancer. By eating foods rich in resistant starch, you can nourish your microbiome and improve your health. Okay, so if we take a look here, on your left is a way that our large intestine is supposed to look inside of our gut. You got these beautiful tight junctions that are like fingers pointing upward. These are your, your villi. And this is a surface area that, you know, is, is basically your, your, your gateway between the outside world and your inside world. When you take all of the surface area of the inside of our gut, and if you were to lay it out in a flat area, it would be between one and two tennis courts in surface area. So you think about it, we have that much surface area and we have that much of exposure to the outside world through the food that we're eating. And we need to make sure that that whole surface is properly maintained. And if we're not eating the right foods that nourish that surface, it's going to get damaged. So when you saw that butyrate coming in there on the left, that's what cells would look like. That's what your gut would look like if it was getting butyrate on a regular basis, day after day after day, that's what it would look like. On the right, if it's not getting the butyrate, if it's not getting the short chain fatty acids that, that, that keep this whole gut inside of us clean and this ecology right, we get damage to that surface of the tennis court, and now you got food particles or microbes that are just getting too darn close to the blood side of the body. And that's when the immune system kicks in. And that's where our bodies are already under all of this stress um, because we got food right too close to where it should be in the body. So this is another picture of it. You can have good areas, but all of a sudden you get a couple of these areas. Now, you hear about all the food allergies that, that we're seeing in our society, especially in the younger people and, and you know, peanut allergies are one of them. It's like, where are all these allergies coming from? It's very simple. If, if we're not giving the children at an early age enough of a buffer, because what, what happens is when you, when you take these villi, the, these tiny fingers, and you load them up and you give them all of the, the nutrition they need, an excess starts to build over that, which is called a mucosal wall. And, and it's like manna from heaven to the cells because, because it nourishes them. And the microbes can actually eat this mucosal wall because it's like stored up food. It's almost like fat on our body, but it's like a fat storage in our gut wall. And the bacteria can eat that. But what happens is when they're not being fed, they eat all of that mucosal wall down. And now you don't have a cushion between the blood side and the other side of your body. And that's where the issues start to come in. Oh, let me get this way. Sorry about that. We'll get it right here.
Okay, so this is the immune system here. On the very top is where all of your food and all of your bacteria are and everything is. Those are your villi. And these bottom cells are called the dendritic cells. And these are my favorite cell of anything that I have seen studying microbiology and all these different formations because these guys are so unique. This is where it all happens. They sit on the blood side of the body and they stick this little antenna up through these tiny junctions in our gut wall and they look around and they do, when I say they look around, what they do is they're able to do a magnetic scan of the DNA of the molecules that are passing by them. And they have enough intelligence that it's either in their database or it's not. And if it's not in their database, then they come back and they now alert the white blood cells to go after this particular cell because it's an invader and it's too close to the blood side. We got the enemy at the gate and you better get the army ready to go after them. And the body starts going into overdrive to produce white blood cells to now get the perceived enemy. But the enemy isn't an enemy at all. The enemy is just food particles or bacteria that shouldn't be that close to the blood system, but they are. Why? Because of lack of maintenance in our gut wall, because we're not keeping our ecology straight, because we're not mindfully understanding what we need to be able to keep proper gut health. So those are the dendrenic cells, and that's what their function is. This is what a normal set of bacteria would look like in a normal ecology, lots of the good guys. But on the right, if you're not feeding them, all these people take up residency. Some of them are hostile. Parasite, the, de the definition of a parasite is any member of the ecosystem that is taking from the system and not contributing back to the system equal or greater than what it takes out. And that's the definition of a parasite. And that's what we end up getting. We end up getting parasites. You know, I had, I had parasites living inside of me that were not contributing to my mental health or my physical well-being, but I was feeding them every day because it tasted good to eat certain things and I didn't have a clue what I was doing when I was doing it. To me, it was mindless eating. It didn't have a purpose. And these are the different degrees. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. It, it, it's constantly changing. It's, it's probably the most dynamic ecosystem and one of the most fast changing ecosystems because these bacteria on average live 20 minutes is the average length of time that the microbe lives in our gut. So that means in one course of, seven, of, of, of 24 hours, one day, they've gone through 72 lifetimes that these bacteria have gone through generation after generation. And that means that if we start eating good, in other words, start putting good feedstock in, start building the colonies back, it, it gradual can happen pretty quick because of the, the exponential growth you can have in the numbers here. So it, it's very hopeful that, you know, when you do have a condition of dysbiosis, that you can bring it back into symbiosis by starting to be aware of what you're bringing into the body. All of these diseases that we hear about, this is a celiac disease, you know, all of the damage to the walls, that's where the, it, it's all coming from. Um, what we did last week was we made a concoction to, to change the ecology inside of us. We took fresh organic fruit, we diced it up, added a cup of water and put it in a blender, made a puree like a smoothie. And then what we did, we heated it for 20 minutes to sterilize any wild bacteria or, or yeast that may be growing in there. And then we added S. Bilardi. That's the probiotic that we talked about earlier, how it kind of pushes out some of the bad guys in the gut. Taking two capsules and putting it in there, it almost looks like yeast when you put it in there. And that's exactly what it smells like. And it, it just started fermenting. And then what you do by doing this is that you could take two pills for a probiotic and put them into your body. That's one way of getting a new strain going in your body. But a more highly successful way is by using what's called a probiotic in its living form, not in its dormant form. Here we're having 
you know, millions and, and, and billions of microbes in every tablespoon that we put in our body and they're fully live and activated, fresh out of our fridge from organic fruit and getting into the body and now starting to get that, that transplant taking place. And you do that slowly introducing it into the ecology and you back off on the foods that the other bacteria like to eat. So um, you put it in the oven with the light on, that's all you need for heat, just mild heat. And you can see it bubbling away here. And it smells just like bread baking as opposed to wine making. So these are foods that if you are, are, are finding that you want to take the candida and, and control it some, these are the foods that you can eat that are very healthy for you that would be uh, cohesive in changing this environment. Um, you know, most of these are fiber-based, you know, very healthy oils. Oils are sometimes overlooked. People don't understand the importance of good, healthy oils because a lot of unhealthy oils will produce unhealthy bacteria growing in high proportions in your gut. Um, other oils are, are almost antibiotic in the way that they act in the body. So oils are very important to make sure you get high quality. And then these are things that you wanna stay away from when you're trying to get rid of candida. These are the foods that candida loves so much that if we contain, if we eat a lot of gluten and a lot of uh, dairy products, uh, cheeses, um, all of those things tend to get candida you know, enforce its, its colonies to grow really well. So those are the things you wanna stay away from. When it comes to fiber, fiber is really the key and that's where the magic takes place. Um, I was just reading today and some of the latest research is saying that women should get a minimum of 25 grams of fiber a day and men should get 38. So, Let's take a look at a couple of things and, and start to say, well, what would I have to do to get close to that number? And, and you know, and if I start looking at this thing and, and start saying, you know, I got to get the fiber back up there, you know, the study also showed that the average American eats between 12 and 15 grams of fiber. And, and that's male and female. So that would mean that it's probably less than 50 percent of what a male's intake should be. Um, and, and if you take a look here, these are red lentils. So just a quarter of a cup of red lentils would give me six grams of fiber. So if I had a half a cup of that, I could get 12 grams there. I still got a long way to go. Here we got green split peas. These I love, these are 11 grams and a quarter cup. So I use these a lot. I actually mix them with other like yellow peas. Yellow peas are actually a lot lower. They're only seven grams. So I'll mix the two when I make pea soup. And when I make pea soup, you know, I'm making it because it's basically my, you know, my, my, my gut chum. It's my gut food. It's, it's, it's really a beautiful way to make gut food because I can put lentils in there. I can put two different peas in there. So I'm getting different colors, the yellow and the green. The, the, I put the, the red lentils in there. So now I'm getting more phytochemicals, all different colors, all different fibers that are coming in all different fav favorite diets for different microbes. And, and that's how I think now, because that's what I've learned, you know, runs this human body and mind on most efficiently. So these, these are the red lentils. Let me, uh, let's see here. So here, this is a can of beans. And a can of beans, we've got uh, three and a half servings there and we're total fiber, six grams. So if you ate a half a can of beans, you could get maybe about 15, 16 more in there. These are black beans. Again, right around the same, around six grams for about a half a cup of the cooked beans. This is chickpea pasta, which is great to incorporate in a diet. Now you could take a pasta meal and you know here you're looking, there's an eight ounce box every two ounces of dietary fiber is about six grams. So there's 24 grams in a whole eight ounce packet. Um, and that's a great way to get fiber into the body. Um, I was listening to one of my, my guys earlier today and he was saying, so you take 
the chickpea pasta and now you want to make the sauce to go with it well you could just get a can of tomatoes or a can of pre-made sauce or what you could do is you could chop up some onions chop up some garlic put some peppers in there um add some herbs in there and get that cooking and now you've got the aromas going now you've automatically increased the diversity and the amount of microbes you're going to be feeding because remember every different food you put in there his goal is he started by counting fiber to make sure he got the fiber up there but then he said the better goal is to do what the american gut project said which was one of the biggest studies ever conducted on human gut microbiome health and that is that if you were to eat 30 different plants every week, you would have excellent diversification and your gut would be in what they consider to be above average shape for our population. 30 different plants in a week. If you think about that and you're honest about it, I don't think there's probably too many people that could say that they eat 30 different plants in a week, but that should be our goal. Because if we do that, then we're going to be bringing in all the different phytochemicals. We're going to be feeding all the different colonies. And we're going to be doing that on a regular basis. And we are going to see the human body and mind operate like it's never operated before, because that's how it's meant to operate. We just never knew what the operating system required or who the main components of the operating system were. So there's my red lentils again. There's beans. I'm going the wrong way. We'll get it right. These are some chickpeas, again, about six grams in the thing. There's some more peas. Okay. This was actually the study that was done by the, um, the American Genome Project or the American Health Gut Project. And on the bottom there, what they show in the bottom right, less than 10 plants, the diversity, and those are all the different colonies in the human body. And the ones on the right, the diversity within those different species were dramatically higher when you had that 30 or more plants in your diet per week because of that diversification. And if you think about it, you know, we are creatures of habit, but if we eat the same thing day after day after day, we're going to get the same results day after day after day. We're going to have the same colonies that we're feeding day after day. If we diversify that, we're going to be bringing a lot more phytochemicals, a lot more different things into our system. And that's, that's what we're meant to have. That's what we were, that's what we were, were, you know, we came from, we came from that. And this, I think is probably the best picture of all, because this really sums it up. The brain in our skull is, is, a, is a brain that we have our ego in and that we understand is a master control. This is a living brain. This brain, 80% of the communications between this and our human brain are from this to the human brain, not the other way around. The microbes that live inside of our gut are constantly communicating with the human body on all different levels. The other thing is this, is that we're now learning, and there were a lot of studies done, about what is the most optimum way to get that ecosystem in the best shape it can be. And that's the process of what they call intermittent fasting, or I call it timed feeding, that you cut your feeding off. You only feed these microbes for eight hours a day, and then you let them starve and you let the colonies collapse, and you let all of their digestion get done, and you let all of the systems diffuse all of their toxins and everything flow, and then everything gets out of the system, and then the system starts up again. And they're finding that if we do that as a human body, that the body will run much more efficiently than if we constantly are putting food into the system, and we're constantly having this continuous fermenting and digesting and, and breaking down process, then nothing gets to shut down. No maintenance gets to take place in the system. And that's truly what we need is we need to have that feedback from the system that, that we put nutrition in and everything is growing and then everything goes in the opposite tide. Um, that's what the science is showing. And 
you know, a lot of the gurus, uh, the, the shamans are saying, you know, we've known that for years, you know, now they're doing studies to show how it affects the human body, but people were showing how going on a fast for, you know, a couple of days, what a profound effect it has. There's a, another thing called a prolon fast uh, by Dr. Longo. He's part of the Longevity Institute and he studied all of the different people that live in the, the blue zones, the areas where people are living to be 100 years plus. And, and, and what he f was looking at is what are the common denominators? And one of the most common denominators is that, you know, fasting is a very important part of what our human physiology is, is both on a physical and a spiritual level. It does it on both levels. Because think about it, if we're, if we're cutting off the microbes and we're now stopping both the parasites and the, and the good microbes from producing the neurochemicals, we're purging the mind as well. We're getting rid of all those systems. We're able to get rid of the toxins. We're able to cleanse the body. Um, so it's, it's really quite profound what we're learning. Um, and, you know, the beauty is this, this stuff is, is new and it's only going to start get, keep getting better and better as time goes on. Um, because we're just starting to to learn more about what all this all, all this new technology is telling us about this world within us um okay all right so um i guess what we could do now is if we have any questions let's see here um, we just had a couple of people come in a little late. There will be a replay, just so you know, on the Singer Farm Naturals um, channel on YouTube. We'll post this afterwards so that everybody can watch the one from last week and the one from this week will be on there. Um, and then I'm going to see here if I can, uh, let's see. Do you add the espalardi after it's simmering or when it's uh, while it's done? What what you want to do is you're just taking your concoction, your smoothie, and you're heating it up to get rid of all of the wild microbes that might be in there, and then you're letting it cool down, back down to the temperature that it would be living within us, or it's going to live, which is in the 80, 90 degree zone, and that's when you add espalardi, and that's the proper temperature too hot would kill it off as well, okay? All right. Um, another thing that one of the guys was telling me on one of the, the calls was that we don't eat enough algae and enough seaweed, and it is a gift that we should have. Um, it's loaded with minerals. It's loaded with all of these phytonutrients, and, you know, getting some of that into our body. Uh, my body kind of craves it. I bought these seaweed sheets that I get and I eat these seaweed sheets instead of making sushi out of it or rolling it up. I just consume it or I'll put it in a soup, but it's loaded with minerals. And one of the things that as human bodies, uh, human beings, we're, we're seeing mineral deficiencies. So getting a lot of minerals is really important for us. Um, would it be better to do two meals a day? Um, that's what we're finding is, is one of the most, you know, usually what people are doing, you know, they're, they're shutting off at least three to four hours before bedtime that they're not consuming any more food. So if let's say you're going to bed at 10, you know, you're probably, you know, six, six thirty. you want to be done with your meal. And then, you know, you go from, you, you got four out, you, you got, you got six hours and then you got another 12 hours. So at noon, you can open your window. You can have something like a um, um, teas in the morning, herbal teas, so you don't break your fast. You can also do, they call them fasting bars. So you're staying in ketosis, you're burning more fats and you're not getting any carbohydrates in the body. And then when you do start to have your meal, you know, between noon and six, you know, you can have a couple big meals. You can eat the whole time. You're, you're you know, you, that's your feeding window. That's the time when you can you can feel comfortable to to consume the good healthy foods that are going to feed your microbes and nourish your body. And just remember too, we should be consuming a lot of water and water is really really important and sometimes I overlook telling the importance of it. 
to me, tap water will not go in my body. Not unless it's put through a filter. Because I do not want chlorine. I do not want fluorine. I do not want all of these chemicals that they put to sanitize that water so no microbes live in it. I don't want to put that in my body. I don't even water my plants with, with water with chlorine because I'm not going to have the microbes in there that I want. So what I do is, is, is the water source. I like reverse osmosis. I like my water filtered. I like it nice and clean. And to me, that's really an important base because that we are, we start out at about 80% water when we're born and we dry out as we live longer and somewhere around 60, 65% water when we die we we tend to be less liquid as we get older and it's important to keep that liquid levels up there um you know keeping track of how much you know i learned how to drink i can drink a quart of water all at once i'm not saying everybody should do that but that's what i can do i can drink a quart of water in one one process i think it was probably back from 20 some years ago when i drank beer maybe i learned that but <laughs> At any rate, I could drink a lot of water and it's important to do a lot of water in the body. It's really important. Um, another question, can you give me a simple way to start? What should I start doing tomorrow? Awareness is the first step in anything is being aware that you want to start to change, that you now are looking at life a little bit different. I don't look at food as feeding the human body now. I'm thinking of it more through this awareness level that who am I going to be feeding with that? Am I just getting that taste bud because it's a donut that tastes sweet and the sugar feeds the candida and the candida release a chemical that makes me feel good? Do, do, do I really want to go through that process or do I want to start thinking, how much fiber am I putting in my body today? What's a good breakfast? Well, Oatmeal is one of the most fantastic breakfasts. Those are, those are whole grains. Have your oats. Get that oats in the body. Um, chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, you know, uh, fruits in a smoothie, all these things. Flax seed in there, you know, variety. Bring them in. Bring them in. That's how we do it. That's how we get healthy. Variety. Um, and how do you start tomorrow? You start, um, here, here's a simple thing is that, I have a goal that every day I at least want to get one probiotic in my body. And if I have a top day, I'm going to get three different probiotics in my body. So what were my probiotics today? A little bit of kimchi I had today. I had some kefir uh, and, and I had some yogurt. So those were my three. And every single day, I want to be getting some probiotics into my body, starting to think about that living things coming in. A little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. The yogurt study. Why wouldn't I want to have yogurt in my body if after 30 days, everybody in the study had a better outlook in life? I wish everybody had yogurt every day. It would make everybody's outlook better and it would be a much better world. But I can only take care of me and my perception is my reality. My perception was a lot different when my microbes were not part of my awareness as to being my responsibility. That if I'm here and I got to get this body in the best shape it can be so I can live long and die quick, I better understand how it's operating. And it's operating with these bugs inside of us and in what proportion based on the feedstock we're going to have them. Um, okay, do you feel different after candida free diet? Yeah, you don't have the cravings. So the cravings are that feeling that just feels good thinking about a bagel. Because just thinking about something starts to ignite that process of those bacteria being excited that they're going to get fed. That's why it's important that we look at this process of feeding the microbes as being a, a profound thing, a, a, you know, a, a sacred thing that we're doing in essence, that we should look at the food, we should think about the food, because that's all part of the process. As soon as that happens, the colonies are becoming aware. The chemicals are starting to flow. The digestive enzymes are all starting. All of that is happening with that process. But we just, you know, we're driving down the road. We grab a bagel, coffee and bagel in traffic and talking on the phone at the same time. Gosh, it's, it, it seems like, like we really don't care about what we're doing to ourselves or what, who we're feeding inside of us. You know, we're losing track of the big picture. Every day should be a gift. It shouldn't be a chore to just get everything done. 
It should be a gift. If we're still alive, the job isn't over. That's the way I look at it. Um, what commercial yogurt do you recommend? Um, so I like organic, grass-fed. I think it's really important that you stay away from commercial things that are given a lot of the antibiotics and are not organic. So organic is, is a must to me. I'd stay away a lot from dairy. I'm seeing more and more problems in our society that are caused from dairy. Um, fermented dairy is a lot better. Unfermented dairy, you know, when I read about how important it is for a young child to be fed by its mother's milk and how the milk in the mother's breast changes almost on a daily basis based upon the growth of that child, it's feeding the microbes in that child and it's changing everything just for that child as the child's developing. That cow is doing that same thing for that calf and the calf is taken away and we're given this super liquid for cows, not humans. And we're putting that in our body and we're doing that because we're told it's so great for us. It's creating more and more problems in the human system. It's not the ideal food we're told. The ideal food of any food on the planet, hemp seeds. They have every single nutrient and amino acid you could possibly want, have hemp seeds. The most complete, hemp milk, have that instead of dairy milk. And you will see, you know, I talked, I listened to these doctors that are, are helping people with leaky gut. They say the one most profound change that they see the biggest difference is eliminating dairy from the diet of their patients. And to me, it makes an awful lot of sense. Nature is so well-versed that if we were meant to get milk on a regular basis, we would each have an udder that we could pull out and socially suck on them and then get our milk daily because nature takes care of us. If we were meant to have that, we'd get it ourselves. That's how you know life is to me, if you ask me. Um, kimchi, can I take a quarter of a meal at each cup? Is it okay? Depending on your system, remember, go slow, not too much at once. If you're used to having a lot of kimchi in your diet and having fermented foods, yeah, it's wonderful. Man, I could sit down sometimes and I could eat a half a cup, cup of kimchi, you know, with rice and just using it as a seasoning. But if your body isn't used to it, remember, go slow. Let's build that body up slowly. We didn't get to dysbiosis overnight. We can't fix it overnight. If we just go slow with it, you're going to start introducing these, these fibers in the diet. You're going to start producing a lot of gas. Don't go from 10 grams of fiber to 40 grams of fiber and think you're going to just cruise right through it. You know, a little slower, build it up, build it up. Easy does it. Easy does it. Let the body build up slowly and then you'll, you'll be comfortable with it. Um, you know, there's a saying, if you're, it, it, when you start eating a lot of fiber, you're going to have a lot of gas. If you're not farting, you're not fermenting. If you're not fermenting, you're not digesting properly. And eventually when the body gets cleaned up, you know, the gas won't smell. The gas smells because it's putrefaction taking place from some of the other processes with the parasites and the non-plant-based digestion that has to take place. Um, somebody says that their body uh, feels cold after eating a half a cup of yogurt. Um, it might be your body's reaction to it. Try a non-dairy yogurt, see if that makes a difference. Um, another thing you might wanna do is try warming up your yogurt and see if that has a difference because you can warm these up back to room temperature or above like they would be in, in the inside of our gut. Those are a couple ways, or maybe it's your body saying it's not quite used to it. Um, but try a couple of those and see if that maybe that that helps a little bit. Um, and and how long does it take to um, get rid of a candida? And and how do you know when they're gone? So first of all, you're never going to get rid of. The goal is you're never you're going to be looking for a balanced system. That's what we want to look at. In other words. We live in a monocrop society. We live in a, in, a, in a regimented society and we always think about, you know, oh, candida is no good, we wanna get rid of it. No, let's think about it this way. The bad guys are good in decent numbers. They have their purpose. Candida should be in our system, but it shouldn't be in the improper numbers. And the reason it got into the improper numbers is because of the high 
volume of food stock that we're giving without getting the diversification in. So if we back off the food stock and we bring in something to help ease it away, and now we're mindful about the food stock, here's the problem that candida has with us. When we eat something that feeds candida, candida produces a chemical that goes to our brain and it, it, it fills a certain neurological pathway that makes us feel just okay, not high. But what happens is when we don't get that chemical, we get used to it and we go through an agitated state that we don't have it anymore and we want it. And it's like a drug withdrawal that creates anxiety. So what we're trying to say is that if you have it in proper balance, you're not gonna have this anxiety drug withdrawal that you're gonna go through that's gonna cause you to wake up in the morning and have a plan and all of a sudden your plan has changed because you got candida telling you they got to get fed and you're driving out of your way to get that bagel because everything is stressful to you. And all of a sudden you eat that bagel, the chemical gets released because the candida gets fed and you go, ah, because you just got a relief from that drug addiction that you that drug withdrawal that you were going to. No different. It's really profound. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, balance is where it's at. Just. Think of it that way. We're not going to eliminate everything. We just want to get back to balance. And that's where everything works best. And if we do that, the body will know its ideal weight. You don't have to even worry about what your weight's going to be anymore. Because you'll be, the body will seek its perfect level. And, and, but that happens when you start to become aware. Like I say, take the time to just go through a course of a day and record two things. How many different plants did I eat today? And how many grams of fiber did I eat today? And just keep track of that. Just back of your mind, just kind of play with it and just see if it moves you a little bit. Because men should have 38, women should have 25 grams of fiber. You know, I got to work at it. And I, and I got this awareness level and I got to work at it to get that. So you'd be surprised. And when you start doing that, my sister, Chris, she, she, you know, she, she'd been trying a lot of different things. And, and finally, you know, we, we talked about a book of fiber fueled, which was this great book here. Um, excellent book, great book. And, and it clicked with her and she says, you know, I'm going to kick the fiber, kick the fiber. Oh my God, what a difference. She says in her life, she became more regular. The, the toxins she could just feel, she, the, the brain fog was dissipating because everything just, you know, you're getting butyrate, the, the, the premium fuel source. You have your choice. You could have sugar, which would be like burning paper in your furnace, or you can have the most beautiful hardwood that will burn, you know, it, it has high BTU output and it's just gonna burn all night, you know, and it's, it's, it's the best fuel source. That's what butyrate is. And we have our choice. What fuel source do you wanna run your body on? The sugars, the simple carbohydrates, or you wanna go with the premium fuels of butyrate. And, it's your choice. Once you switch to the other, it's different. Um, having gas is a process of getting the bacterias back into the balance. Um, and, and if gas becomes an issue, um, then there are some things you can look at. Um, I know I've done some research for people. A lot of things what I do is if they do feel gassy, eating certain things, back off, bring it down to a fraction of what you're doing and slowly introduce it in. Because then when you got the colonies in there, um, you see there's, if let's say we bring something in like, like kale that hasn't been in the body before, there's good bacteria that we want to digest that, but there's other bacteria that may have been fed that it may not be the premium food source for them, but they're gonna digest them and they produce a lot more gas at the same time. So what you gotta realize is that we gotta bring things in balance as we bring the food source in slowly, we can build these guys up to the proper balance. If we bring it in too fast, we might be feeding some of the guys that are gonna cause that discomfort or the second set of bacteria that need to come in and diffuse some of that fiber aren't there yet because they haven't been fed for a while. So you know, try to, try to just anytime discomfort back off slow it down, realize got to get the colony growing. And they're always going to be different. You might have the best bacteria in colony around, you know, today, and you feel like a million bucks. And 
you know, two days, all of a sudden the colonies have shifted because of, you know, change in food stock, change in, what, you know, stress levels, whatever, and, and nothing is working the way it was just a couple of days ago. But that's okay, because it'll come back, because it does. It's where is the trend and where is the, you know, the level of balance. All right, so we're at eight o'clock and uh, 8.05, we're gonna call it a day. Um, we'll have another workshop probably starting in two or three weeks. We'll get into CBD again, and then we'll do some more talk about gut microbiome health. Because to me, this is, this is really the essence of where we, if we focus, we can understand how simple life can be but we have to understand what the purpose of this process we do, which is eating truly does, what it can affect and how it can affect our lives and our health. Like I say, if you, know, if, if you can produce serotonin by eating properly and that changes your mood, why wouldn't you wanna do it? Or go the pharmaceutical route and get a, um, a, a, a Prozac or, you know, another drug that will keep whatever serotonin your body does have in your system longer by using a pharmaceutical. To me, I want to eat to be happy, and that's what I do. And if I have a little fermenting gas on the way, it's okay. You know, it's it's part of life, and it's it's a healthy it's a healthy sign. So, thanks everybody for taking time out of your day. Have a great night.